Ouais, c'est vrai. Hey, the devil, how are you, man? Hey, top of the to you, too. Good to see you, man. <laughs> okay, for the purpose of today, uh, with the kit in the room here, sounding very sweet, we've got, um, for the purpose of this experiment, we've got a, a wee mic down in the bass room here. I've just got a wee sort of handheld over this side of the kit, which is right here. Um, and on this side of the game, we've got another sort of handheld right here over this side of the kit. And really, it's just about capturing the ambient sound of the room and the kit. So the only thing that's really sort of close mic that you like would be the wee sort of wee handheld mic on the bass drum. So um, hopefully, we get some. Uh, Something that sounds reasonably good. That's Les in the background there doing some technical things that yeah. I, I don't know about. So, yeah, getting there. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're all doing well out there. Um, it's been a wee while since we've done any sort of podcast stuff here at Castle, so um, uh, we've got one for you today. I know it's a guy that we've been looking to speak to about his music and his sort of influences, how he got started. Um, so today we have the mighty Les Barrett with us. All right, Les, how are we doing, man? Yeah, I'm good, Jimmy. Yourself? Great, man. Good to see you. As I say, it's been a while um, if we've done anything like this, but it's, it's, since we're hopefully starting to get back towards some sort of level of normality, we thought we'd uh, get this going again with the sort of podcasts. And I'm sure not just the drummers out there, there's loads of people that I know, friends and musicians, would, would be interested to know how you get started on the drums. I know a lot of people rave about your playing, and uh, so... Uh, what got you started playing the drums then? Where did you start? Well, it all started, I was three. My mum's brother bought me a drum kit for Christmas because it was an old joke. What do you buy somebody you don't like swains? A drum kit. And that's where it started. And I took to it like a duck to water. Then when I was seven, I joined the boys' brigade and went straight to the pipe band and... They taught me the rudiments, everything else. By the time I was nine, I was so mad on it mm -hmm. and I wasn't allowed to do anything with it. I got a paper round and I saved up the money, £32, and I bought an autocrat John Gray drum kit, a three-piece drum kit. 32? 32. 32 quid, aye. I saved up for a year, right? So uh, would that be, is that actually like a starter kit back then, or was it just a sort of toy? No, uh, uh, it was a professional kit, but they, they were made as as they made them back then. It, mm -hmm. it didn't even have a, a proper sized bass drum. Mm -hmm. It had an 18 and a half inch bass drum. Mm -hmm. So if I needed a new skin for it, I had to take it into the drum shop in Blackie Street and get them to roll a pig skin nice. skin onto it Please. and then heat it up to tension it. What about the, um, so you, did you get, the, the boys brigade, that was like training, it's kind of rudiments on snare type? What yeah, that that, that that was pretty much snare work. Um, when it came to the actual kit playing, th th there was a couple of different things, like I would sit in the house and I would play along with adverts and I would play along and Simon Phillips, uh, Dancing with the Devil, when it, that was 1974 or something like that, they just I would sit and set up pillows around about the, mm -hmm. the living room and sit and play along with that and then round about the age of 9 or 10 a guy that stayed across the road from me Fraser Watson right. the guitarist with the poets and he, he played with everyone and I've every met Fraser before yeah you so, have I. Yeah, yeah. so and he was like come on son get the drums out for uh, that nice day during the summer holidays yeah. and I'd go in his back garden and he'd have the guys for Marmalade and everybody else who are just sitting teaching me how to play drums, Big Jackson and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it kept going like that. Then by about, I think about 17 or 18, I went to a youth club and there was a, a jazz band. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy called Jim Polland, who was a piano player. And I went in and I was kind of, trying to get into the rock band but he heard me and asked me if I'd ever played jazz and I was like no but I'd been listening to a lot of Zappa and stuff like that which Fraser had got me into which meant that my drumming wasn't quite the normal kind of pop stuff or punk stuff 
and I started with that and I don't know, it, it just changed my life. So how did you, when you get introduced to um, obviously Zappa and obviously get introduced to sort of jazz or whatever, yep. did you start taking lessons at that point? Yeah, I went to a guy called Brian Costello who was a drummer from East Kilbride. He's now, I think, lives in Blackpool. He was Joe Longthorn's drummer for a long time. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he was really good at teaching me how to teach myself, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. it's, and just introduced me to look, look, reading music and stuff like that. It was, it was great that way. But um, I don't know, I just... It's kind of hard to describe. I just got this epiphany one day and then I heard Jacob Pistorius and that was it. Yeah, weather report stuff. Like that. Yes. So when you got there, you started taking sort of jazz lessons at that time. Um, I know when I first met you, you just, um, you just come off the ships. Yeah. That was the first time I'd met you. I don't know when that was. Do you, do you remember what? 1998. N 1997 actually, yeah. So that's when I met you, see, obviously you'd done a lot of stuff way before that. So how did you actually get involved, um, how did you get onto the ships in the first place then? Well, by that point I'd, I'd been doing hundreds of different things. I know you worked in Blackpool on it as well, did yeah, you? Yeah, I, I did all the big uh, like sort of cabaret things, mm -hmm. right? And I, I, I took the job for seven months with Little and Large for a laugh, right? in the Paradise Room mm -hmm. in Blackpool because I wanted to be at the Pleasure Beach because I love roller coasters mm -hmm. and I met hundreds of great guys around about then but I, I'd just been doing kind of the cabaret circuit and at that time it was fantastic mm -hmm. it was all live musicians and you'd have Bobby Davro one night and that was I remember I met um, Jim Hanna Jim Hanna I so you worked with Jim at that time yep yeah. that was Jim Hanna myself great uh, Stuart Smith, fantastic bass player, uh, John Rutherford and all that. It was just th th there was a bunch of right, and we were doing stars in the rise and stuff like that as well. Yeah. It was just all fun. So your reading chops were pretty decent at that time as well, yeah. Yeah, a lot better than they are now because <laughs> I was doing it every day. So from there, did, did you come away for that, and, and that's when you went on the ships? Uh, yeah, well, I moved back over to America again. I kind of bounced back and forward. Uh, studying with guys from Berkeley and New York and uh, Texas. Was that funded? Did you get any funding towards that? Was that totally? I, I got a scholarship for Berkeley, but I never used it because mm -hmm. I went there and it wasn't what I was, they were wanting to teach me too much about harmony and melody, and that's not what I wanted. I wanted rhythm, mm -hmm. so I kind of moved into New York for a wee bit, and I was at a PIT Percussion Institute, and then from there I moved into New Orleans. Because uh, I wanted to go back to the, the kind of the basics of jazz, and but, but it was hard down there. It was very hard. Mm. They were very in terms of the sort of musicianship and that kind of thing. Or? The guys were absolutely stu everybody was stunning. Even the buskers were the best drummers in the world, mm. right? But it was also quite racist because I was white, mm -hmm. and they weren't. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was back late eighties, early nineties, it was kind of frowned on that white guys playing jazz. So uh, I found that a bit difficult and I don't know and eventually as I met you as I came back to Britain mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to do I realised that there was no pension scheme in music yep. and I wasn't going to be a rock star mm -hmm. although I never really wanted to be anyway mm -hmm. and I took a real job and then I met you guys yep. yourself, Gordon and I introduced you to Big Kev and all the rest of it and we all know the rest of it and for then, for 1998, 97. Yeah, well it's quite interesting because obviously I can, when I first met you, but prior to that, it's, it's quite interesting because uh, I know we've known each other for years, there's a lot of stuff that you've mentioned that I've, I've never really known. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's good to get, you know, even before I met you, what, you, what you'd been up to kind of thing, you know, but obviously when we met, uh, we started jamming with different tunes, started writing some music as well. So, yep. what about, um, you know, even for then to now, with your sort of um, influences are, and obviously when you first started, you mentioned Zap and some of the jazz guys. Uh, what about the big band drummers? Because I know you were a big uh, Buddy Rich fan. Absolutely. Uh, Buddy Rich, but Louis Belson, absolutely fantastic. A guy called Gordon Scott, 
is from Louisiana. Absolutely nobody knows about him. Man, what a player. This guy could freeze like you wouldn't believe. Mm-hmm. But the best one of lot, Steve Gadd. Yeah. When you listen to his phrasing, playing with the Buddy Rich Orchestra, right? You t- take his bass drum and just zero in on that. It's stunning. Mm-hmm. But his whole phrasing, everything about it, his grace notes. So, the real guys are Gad, Finney Collier, Weckl nowadays, who I used to, had the privilege of studying with the guy that taught him, Ed Sof. And Ed always says, back, back way then, wait till Dave grows up and gets older. Wait till you hear what he's doing, and you listen to him now, and it's just like, oh my god. I still can't believe that um, um, Steve Gadd played Mulgai just a couple of years ago. I took you to that gig, Jimmy. <laughs> I believe. It. Well, you told me you want to go to a gig. I said, "Who is it?" Like, Steve Gadd, and he says, "I was playing up Mulgai," and that's straight away I'm like, "I see a wind up." But no, you're right. Uh, I don't know how who sort of sponsored that whole thing. And the, it was the Steve Gadd. Uh, I don't even. It was an organ player and the sax. Yep. Sax player and um, what a, what a gig that was. You know, I, I still. It was Bleacher, Hammer and Gad. Could you remember that? Yep. So, and it was it was so much fun to watch your face that night. Oh, I just incredible. You, 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 we were sitting four feet away from his, his drum kit, right? Mm. 72 year old. But then two nights later, I took you to the concert hall and we went to see Zappa play Zappa. Aye. Aye. And you sat again and the two, two of us were totally knackered because I was just back from Dubai <laughs> and I think I had COVID, but we don't know what it was. <laughs> Right, and you just sat there all night and went, oh my God, this is the tightest thing I've ever seen in my life. I mean, these guys are just another universe, really, you know. Um, all, all we can do is watch and just keep on grooving, I guess, you know, but... Uh, was we amazing. are mere mortals. Exactly, Steve Gadd and then obviously these guys. Um, so what would you say, um, now, I know these guys, I, I'm influenced by a lot of these guys as well, and, um, you know, whether it be jazz, funk, rock, soul, country, music, anything, it's just a great melting pot to be able to take all that stuff and obviously absorb it and obviously hopefully you as a musician comes out um, what would you say your, your most enjoyable thing as I've yet to pick maybe one thing over the years in terms of you know a period in your life up to now you know it, it was a real sort of you know for you were a kid even right through to um, you know all the kind of highs and lows of been out playing with different guys uh, musicians on the road as well we, you know, what would you say is all the best things about that, and what would be the worst things that you don't like? Oh wow, that's quite hard. Um, do you know what? I love the the camaraderie of being in a band, mm-hmm. right? I remember a long, long time ago, and it was one of the early Glasgow jazz festivals, and it was Jim Mullins' band, then to the nineties band where. Lawrence Call and or just all the Mornington Lockett, all the guys, right? I remember. Remember, we went to uh, it was a jam se- an after hours jam session. And, um, well, no, it wasn't that. It was the one that was at the one of the big hotels up in the city. It was it was a jam from 12, 12 uh, at night Aye. through to the early hours, and yeah. um, it was one of the hotels there. But uh, I, I know the hotel. I can't remember the name uh, yet. Uh, the Lorne Hotel. It was. Was it? Aye, yeah. the Lorne Hotel in uh, just off Great Western Road. Mm-hmm. There used to be a lot of great stuff happening there, yep. you can, all this so, sort of. But I, I remember being at one of the gigs, and there was a drummer called Danny McGlashan, and he turned around to me and went, I can't believe how tight they guys are, and Andy's a, a well-quoted drummer now, and I turned around and I went, but that's the difference, that's being in a band, not just being a session guy, mm-hmm. where they knew what was going to happen before it was going to happen. Yeah. It was a real conversation mm-hmm. instead of we're, we're talking to one another, right? It was a, a total conversation. So I like that. Um, I loved the time when I played percussion with Brass Street. Mm-hmm. I had a 18 piece marching Brazilian band. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it was just fantastic, and we toured all over Britain all the time. You done this sort of Zydeco thing as well with Yes, I, 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 I Christ, that was way back, man. Uh, See, you've missed that, but there's a big chunk <laughs> missing. <laughs> there's so many chunks that are missing. Uh, ah, yeah, the Zydeco, they were amazing. Uh, and that was Liam, again, I got to meet yep, Liam. Liam Howitt, Chaz Stewart, Andy Allen, 
and we were hotter than a hot thing. We were tight as anything. Uh, supported run rig in the Canada America tour of the world tour and all the rest of it. It was just, it, it was an absolute riot. It was great fun, really just mental. I've not seen Liam for a long time, I don't know. I've not seen Liam for two or three years. I, th- I think he's a, a wee tortured soul at the minute. He needs to find himself again. Uh, he's enjoying life. <laughs> Certainly is <laughs> I. <laughs> So it's so, all you know, that time. What do you focus on now? Obviously, we're getting older. Aye, we're getting on a bit. Yes. You know, aye. So, what, what's, uh, what, what type of things do you focus on? I know you're playing with the ABBA thing currently. You're yes. Obviously, it's been it's suspended at the minute, but um, it's been suspended, but it's going to go very well again. But unfortunately, I'm going to outgrow that before it outgrows me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm going to get too old. They're all lovely young, talented people, mm-hmm. and I'm getting old. So I'll, I'll hopefully catch another, I don't know, three years of that. It's looking like there's going to be a lot of touring, sort of, uh, for me anyway, because I'm not full time. I think what I'll be doing is I'll be flying out on the Friday morning to whatever country and then fly back in the Monday afternoon. I'm hopefully going to change my career a bit to accommodate this. Uh, and apart from that, I'm still thinking about playing a bit of jazz, uh, playing a bit of big band. I, I really need to get my chops back up for the big band stuff mm-hmm. because there's a couple of new people who seem to be getting involved with the, the new B Scottish big band and these guys are serious players, so I need to get my... My, my act together for that if I want to stay there but do you not feel as if it, as you get a bit older a bit more sort of seasoned as a musician um, you, you, can, uh, you, you focus more on the sort of groove aspect that like makes stuff sound good rather than chops and you know technique it's just making us something Absol- right. absolutely man that, that's what it's all about right uh, 20 years ago I could play everything and any time signature you wanted. Nowadays, I can sit on the groove and make it groove. I can take it over the bar line, go way by the bar line, come back to where the bar is, but it's still grooving. So there's a lot of crap at my plane now. That, but sometimes crap is required as well. <laughs> well, as, the thing is as well, there's, there's really um, there's no any shortcuts to get that to that point. You've got to kind of come through all this stuff and get to a point where you realise what's the important things to play, I think. That's what I feel anyway. I think the biggest thing, and a lot of people forget this, right, especially when you're playing the drums, right, it's about the balance, right? You hit drums differently. Each drum has a different volume, right? So there's a balance in there, and it's, is it your hi-hat, is it your snare drum, your bass drum, your toms, right? They all have a balance, That's a good point. right? And to get that, you flow together, right? Mm-hmm. You, you have to hit every drum and every cymbal differently. Mm-hmm. Some of them you need to dig in, some of them you need to draw the sound out of. Sometimes you've got your rim shot it, sometimes you're tickling it. Right, but are you tickling it in the middle? Are you tickling it at the, the left or right hand side? And that's the same with the toms. The only one that that doesn't really equate to is the bass drum. But a lot of people don't realise when you're a drummer, you don't have two horns and feet. You've got two horns and two feet. So you've got four limbs that you need to control. And the the, the way I'm playing the new. I've actually I've got a <laughs> I've got a new toy, I've got another hi hat, which is a remote hi hat. And I'm learning how to play with two feet with my hi hats as well as two feet with my bass drums. And I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what that happens in the next couple of years, but only in a groove situation. Right. What about um tuning? The, the drums what's your thoughts on that I'm sure the drummers that listen to this hopefully it's maybe interested in getting some advice on that because personally I know I've played by a lot of uh, drummers over the years and um, maybe a lot of the guys uh, they, they don't you know really delve right into the tuning of the drums properly I feel as if they're missing out something that would oh, Tuning what is, kind of advice would you give on that? Tuning is so important right <laughs> it's, it's hard to describe Um you put a new skin on to 
you've got a skin that's been there for six months but what you've got to do is learn your craft right that there is a way to do it you get the top skin you get the bottom skin so the top skin and um, pretty much you want to kind of nail it near where the overtone of the shell is so take all the the skins and the lugs off right hit the shell it'll give you a note then you want to tune the top skin as close as you can to that right the bottom skin you want that about a quarter turn up from the top skin although there's different ways of doing it because if you want it to go boo right you, you can loosen one nut and let it, it, it it's totally your your own thing but there's, there's no right and wrong then no there, there's no right and wrong right but You've got to get it in the ballpark, sort of thing. There's one of those, it's like, everybody says, oh, you've got a cracking sound and drum kit. You can get a cracking sound and drum kit anywhere with a decent set of skins and some tuning knowledge, right? The difference is when you get a brilliant sound and drum kit is when both are right, the, the bearing edges are right for the skins, the skins are right, the hoops are right, everything else, and that's just today with kind of quality, but... To get a, a good sounding kit, you, you can tune any kit to sound good. And I remember speaking to you about that before, but even some of the sort of budget kits nowadays, the way they make them. And the They're fantastic. Them. Yeah. They really are. Uh, I've had a couple of Peril Masters kit. Well, the Masters are probably a bit up, but even a, a Peril Export kit, they're very good kits. And if you tune them properly, they sound great and use the right skins that take away the wee kind of rough edges on it and stuff like that mm -hmm. so th there's skins that can do all that kind of stuff but mm -hmm. the biggest thing is, is when you go into a room you sit down and hit the drums and you'll hear the way it's reacting with the room and then tune it accordingly does it need to be dampened does it need to be brighter um, I don't know yeah well but Mike and I can't, I'm sure some folk might be interested in you know and uh, maybe even live and in the studio I know sometimes that can be a bit of a trial and error type thing, yep. Well, I kind of trust myself more days, more today than I used to to sound engineers. Aye. But I do have my own full set of mics that I can close mic the kit from top to bottom. Uh, Again, that comes back to how to, you know tuning the tuning thing is going to be quite yep. critical to get a sound, Aye. especially if it's close mic like that. But it's not just the tuning, it's, it's the balance again. Yeah. No, I mean, if you're battering lumps out the cymbals and tickling the drums, then it doesn't work. So it's a balance. It's, the whole thing is a balance. Yeah. And like, they say people, oh, the sound engineer messed up my sound. Well, actually, no. You've got a sound. All they need to do is amplify it. So if you've got a sound, then the sound's there. Mm. Again, that's obviously experience would get you to that point, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what, what would you say uh, uh, the things you enjoy most about the, you know being a musician, you know being a gigging musician, and you know playing, uh, you know, with bands, different bands over the years. What, what's the thing you enjoy the most about that? The whole thing is whoever I'm playing with, and I'll, it always ends up the same way. They end up my family. Yeah. Uh, it's a family. It's a family thing. I can be doing a wee theatre tour. Uh, I could be doing like us with the Beavers for nine or ten years. We never really done anything, but we had great fun doing it. Mm -hmm. And we were family. Um, just, it's my social life. It's, and it keeps me mentally active. Just couldn't live without that, you know, you need no, to in your I, life. I, I, you know? um, I did take a wee break after something happened yeah. and it was you that came and got me. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't played for about nearly three years. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if you remember us and you just come up to my house and you says, right, grab the drums, we're gone. Oh well, at least I done something right. Ah, you did. <laughs> And it, it was after Anne passed, after and I hadn't played, played for ages. Oh, yeah. And you just come up and went, get the drums. I went down to Balak, and we played, uh, it was either the, wasn't it Doghouse, what was it? Was it a gig, or was it just a jam session? Or it was a jam session, no, and you me set drums up. There was loads of great things happened in there, in, in the past, hopefully that will come back, and we can get back to that. I hope so. No, but that, that, that night, I remember putting on Facebook that music really does help. Oh, wow, it definitely helped. Oh, can I agree more, man? Can I agree more? It's a great thing. 
So what was um just to start a round after day lads, what would what would, um young guys coming up now? Young and old I guess, everybody, what advice would you give it to people who's wanting maybe even just starting music, interested or even just the seasoned players that you know, what what advice would you give to musicians? No. Do you know what the biggest thing at the lot is enjoy it? No. Hon- honestly, just enjoy it, right? It's I've never been able to learn another language, right? But I've been able to speak to people all over the world that I couldn't communicate with vocally, but I could communicate with musically. Right. So it's it's a world phenomenon and you've just got to go with it. Have good fun and communicate with everybody and just be nice. I agree with that. Listen, man, I'm going to wrap up there. Uh, I'd like to thank you again for taking the time to have a chat with us. We've done a wee bit of recording earlier on there, just in the room. Uh, so um, you'll see a video shortly. You can see Les banging away at the drums, and you can make make up your own mind. So again, the day I'd like to thank you once again, Les, for taking the time to have a chat with us, and uh, hopefully we'll catch you again soon at the next gig. Jimmy, thank you so much. I didn't expect this at all. I thought I was just playing one of your tunes. <laughs> uh, my pleasure, mate. Okay. Cheers. All right, guys, catch you later. Bye. Thank you.